What would it be like to have a career within sustainability? Well, clearly this is a professional realm that is growing in scope and importance. Well, on today's episode, we're going to get into that. Fortunate enough to welcome this guest on who's a head of sustainability. And you might be wondering, well, what is that all about? What are the roles and responsibilities associated with that job? What does a day in the life look like? What does it take to succeed? These are just a smattering of questions and topics that we get into in this episode. And the guest, her name is Stephanie McClarty, and she is a head of sustainability for one of the largest e-waste recyclers in the country of Canada. And she was kind enough to break down down her work, her role, and all of this great stuff. Now, as I always say, I do encourage you to listen to the full-length audio version. There's a lot more wisdom, insight contained within that. And you can find that wherever you access your podcast. Just do that search for life as a dot dot. All right. Well, I think it's about time to get into things. So why don't we? Now, to get things started, I want to give Stephanie the opportunity to share some direct advice to anyone who is interested in getting into this field of sustainability. So here is some words of wisdom, essentially, from Stephanie relating to stepping into this world. Biggest advice in this whole area of sustainability is to get started somewhere. Because this is a a newer and emerging field, It's not so common that people join at an entry-level sustainability professional and work their way up. What's been happening is that there's been lateral moves. So for example, in my case, I came from entrepreneurship and and, came into sustainability. There's others who are in quality, health, and safety type roles who are coming into sustainability, even sales roles, business development, coming into sustainability. So my advice is, Find a company that you really love and that cares about the planet and, you know, get started somewhere in that company, take a position and let them know that you're interested in this space, raise your hand, volunteer. And as, as things progress and as, you know, the company progresses, the world progresses, there may just be a sustainability role right there within the company, being part of that evolution. And I think that's what to expect. And who knows, in future, there there might be more of a direct path, but there's so many opportunities to get into a company and then do more of a lateral move within the company into the sustainability space. Now, to ensure that we're all on the same page here, here's a clip of Stephanie breaking down what the term sustainability means or how it's referenced within the business world. We're now releasing sustainability being framed as ESG, environment, social, and governance. And increasingly, even in the last couple of years, more and more, that's how sustainability is applied to running a business, growing a business, making sure that we are good you know, corporate citizens in those three areas. So it's, it's a little bit different. And the history of why this whole ESG approach to sustainability and business came about is because investors about seven, eight years ago started realizing we need to evaluate companies on other metrics than just financial. And so that's when this whole ESG came about because ESG is more about data-driven approaches to sustainability. Sustainability is a concept. I mean, I often define it as meeting the needs of today without compromising that of the future. That's a really sort of common definition. But at the same time, like, what does that really mean? And Mm. how does that then color how we run our businesses and what we do in our businesses? And that's where ESG came along, where it's not just about the investor sphere now. It's about giving your business a dashboard of all these other indicators and metrics that are not just the financial side. And guess what? All of these ESG indicators also help to reduce risk in business. So it all kind of comes back to you know being a good business long term, but it's this lens of like being a good business on all levels. 
All right, well, next up, I've got this clip of Stephanie breaking down her role, once again, as head of sustainability. Now, just keep in mind, of course, she is gonna reference this in terms of generalities, but then also too, her role might be a little bit different within her company as opposed to some others. Either way though, I think it's going to give you this, this bigger sort of broad insight into this type of position. So check it out. I basically have two sides to my role. And I think for a lot of sustainability professionals, we do. So part of my role is internal facing. It's about you know, making sure the company is, is sustainable. We have um, 10 different metrics that we're working towards that we publish in our annual impact report. So it's all about ensuring the company itself is sustainable. And then the other side of my role is outward facing and more you know, external working with customers, doing thought leadership, um, speaking at conferences, and there's that that dual side. And personally, I really like that because it pulls on, you know, different expertise and I have to like kind of step into different roles and wear different hats, which as an entrepreneur, I did anyway. Yeah. Um, I also like it too, because the role is both strategic in the way that it's about setting strategy and creating plans to like do the strategy, but it's also, you know, operational and that actually I got to do the stuff mm. and make it happen and get buy-in. And yeah. so I like also that sort of dual role. And I think um, that's also something that's common in sustainability. It's about like leveraging your stakeholders and getting them aligned to where you want them to go. Now, for me personally, one of the most insightful portions of the conversation is represented in this next clip. And it's coming out of a segment called A Day in the Life. And I just love the way that Stephanie breaks down, you know, her role, her position, and how it changes throughout the year. So anyway, check it out. A lot of professionals at a certain level, you don't necessarily do the same thing every day. But one of the things I've really realized about my role is that I have different seasons of my role. So mm. I often have different projects that I'm working on and they happen at different times of the year. You know, for example, I mentioned Quantum's impact report. We're just about to kick off our impact report season, if you will, <laughs> um, which takes four or five months and requires different steps around collecting the data and then making the report and getting feedback and making it pretty and all of that. So that's like this season. I have just had a season that's very much outward facing in which I was doing site visits and speaking to our team members and meeting with customers and speaking at conferences. So that that was just the season that I was in. But it's it's really great because I basically have different aspects to my role and it just it depends on, you know, what things are needed to be done when. But one of the aspects to my role is around our sustainability performance as a company. Mm -hmm. And in many ways it's around carbon reduction. We have set at Quantum a goal to be carbon neutral by 2030. And so in order to get there, we have different projects that we need to work on. One of the things we're working on this year is our natural gas usage. We see it's more than 50% of what we need to reduce. And so it's it's starting to understand, okay, like where where is our usage? What are the options? And it's pulling in different stakeholders, both in the company, but externally as well. So it's getting our operational folks, um, you know, involved in that conversation, our finance folks, um, but then also leveraging outside um, vendors. And so that's, you know, one of the projects that I'm working on. Also, um, we were just, we did a carpool um, program to reduce our, our emissions for employees, but also to look at, you know, what are the, what are, what do people want and need in terms of carpooling? Um, packaging is coming up as an area of focus where we're going to look at um, how to make our packaging more sustainable across the company. And one of the things that I did when I first joined Quantum was set up a green team. And a green team is, in our case, 
it's a committee that is that has representation from across the company um, in different roles. And we come together once a month and we work on these multi-site, multi-stakeholder projects together. So that is something that, you know, I have meetings um, for that and, and figuring out those different puzzle pieces. Um, another thing that's on my, my radar is uh, the outside facing thought leadership aspect. And we have a podcast. So yeah. uh, I totally, I love your podcast and I totally uh, want to acknowledge you for all the work and the impact that your podcast has. Um, so, you know, today I was meeting with our marketing manager, who's our podcast producer, and we were figuring out our podcasts for the next three months. And we had a pre-meeting with one of our guests. Stepping through open doors. That's a metaphor that Stephanie uses to kind of describe her own career pathway and how it took shape. And what I really liked about it is there's a certain inspirational element to all of this. And also too, a lot of practical advice contained within this next clip. So again, get those uh, pencils ready, that notepad ready. Yeah, take some notes. I think this is something you're really gonna wanna key in on. So for me, I always knew that I wanted to do something where I was making a difference and sustainability, which is something that I didn't really have to think about. It was just, you know, mm. something I was naturally passionate about. But the other thing was I, I stepped through open doors. And so, you know, did I originally envision starting a company in sustainability? No, not at all. I didn't even <laughs> think of entrepreneurship as as an option. Mm. But um, for me, it was because after I finished my undergrad and I went and traveled um, for about two years and and worked and I came back and and started my master's and I actually did my master's in Austria oh, wow. and I was pretty much broke at the time because as much as I'd worked while I traveled, I just basically made enough to survive and that was it. Mm -hmm. So my thought was, I'll do my master's, but I'll do one semester and then I'll come home, work for a bit, make some money and then go back and finish. And it's what I did. And the job that I got hired on to was at a major telecom company in Canada. And I was hired on to an asset recovery project. I didn't even know what asset recovery really meant prior to that. <laughs> and I essentially was hired on as a worker and I wore steel toed boots and I drove around a company van and I went out to the old network sites and physically pulled out the old equipment and figured mm -hmm. out what to do with it. And I did that for about eight months and then went back to school and finished. And I developed this really niche knowledge of telecom infrastructure equipment and what to do with it, Wow, wow. <laughs> which still makes me laugh because <laughs> <laughs> that was not something I planned. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, but that just, you know, walking through that open door and then realizing, oh, like a lot of companies need help with this. So I started consulting while I was finishing my master's and just doing it on the side. And from there, it just, you know, one thing after another, I, I started Reficient and because I thought, you know, we need a technology based solution to really mm -hmm. deal with this. And, and that's what it was. It wasn't that I had this, you know, straight path plan for myself. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I knew I was interested and good at different things, but it was simply doors opened. I walked through and it led to, you know, another thing and another thing. And actually it's, it's also what happened with quantum, you know, yeah. quantum, the opportunity came up and I thought, you know what, this is a yes. Mm -hmm. I walked through that door and, you know, here I am today. So for anyone listening who is worried about, you know, what am I going to do or what am I going to do next? Yeah. Don't have to have it figured out, you know, pay attention to the doors that open and walk through the ones that seem really exciting and interesting to you. All right, I do want to squeeze in one more clip here, and this one is an absolute gem. Here, Stephanie is breaking down what it takes to succeed within the ESG space. You know, one thing that strikes me as I'm listening to you explain all of this is, is the enthusiasm associated with it all. And I think that's something that, again, from an outsider's perspective, like 
working within this space, you, you almost, it's great to have that, but it's almost a necessity to do it well, right? You really need that. And you need, like you said, that buy-in from the top, you know, as far as the organization goes and, you know, the, the commitment to it. And then the support staff, the, the, your fellow employees to also be fully aligned with it, you know, and, and considering this, when I was researching for this talk, and again, speaking with other professionals within sustainability and ESG, like this always seems to come out is, is it's this field to me strikes me as different. Like you could be say mm. within accounting perhaps and nothing against this profession, but you wouldn't necessarily need the same level of buy-in to do that job well, or to be efficient in it. But I think within the space that you're living and operating within, it's almost a necessity to have that sort of inner drive, of course, to, to help the company hit you know, financial targets and, and whatnot, but then also to have this greater sort of push and motivation just to do good in the world, really, you know, it's kind of what it comes down to as well. Like, okay. yeah, I'd love to hear your take on that. Is that something you'd agree with that assessment? I mean, I think in order to really be a leader in this space and to really take your company to new places in terms of being a sustainable business, yeah, because you're basically like, creating a vision of a like of a new future like mm. like look we we can be a great business we can decarbonize along the way and like we can do this mm -hmm. you basically have to inspire others to get in alignment with that and i think in order to do that in order to inspire others you know you need you need the data and like the hard facts and the truth but you also need that that softer emotional side, you need to appeal to emotions. And so I, I think I would agree with you in order to, you know, do it at a certain level, having mm. that, that like passion and energy for this space that rubs off on others is a really big asset so that you can yeah. like get an alignment to that future that yeah, that you are yeah. helping to create. It kind of yeah. fuels that 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 dedication to hitting those objectives because certainly it doesn't sound always, you know, easy. Maybe some of these metrics that you're working on and and you know, the different seasons you're speaking of earlier pulling together this data and and then you know, being honest as well as you'd mentioned earlier when you're not hitting the targets, when things aren't going the yeah. right way. You know, to to have that internal motivation or to have that alignment with this greater mission or cause, I think that can act as that conduit or, or you know, it fuels you to keep pushing further and to find new ways and continually innovate yeah. in order to, you know, ultimately break through. So, yeah. 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 And, you know, the thing that came up for me to just listening to you is how we need to get out of our own way, you know, in order to harness that, that passion and that energy to really thrive in the space of sustainability. So often it's, hindered by our own stuff, our own, you know, mindset blocks and not believing in ourselves. And as sort of a parallel story, that's, you know, not really related, but something else that I realized that I was in my own way for back in the very early days of starting my company, I had the title president on my business card. And I was 30 years old and a female in a very male dominated space. And I was so insecure about calling myself president that I didn't hand out my business cards. <laughs> and it actually took one of our customers, one of our big customers who I did in that case, you know, sort of sheepish, yeah. sheepishly handed him <laughs> my business card. And he was like, wow, president, that is so cool. And it made me realize in that moment, this is all just in my head. Like mm -hmm. I, I'm creating this problem. This is not an actual problem. And from that point forward, I stepped into being president. And mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing in this space. Like step into your possibility or your leadership as a sustainability professional. And you've got to believe it yourself in order to to like have other people believe yeah. in you too, but yeah. you can do it.
just get yeah. out of your own way. All right, well, I think this might be a nice point to wrap up this video, but as always, I do encourage you to go check out the full length audio recording. There we dive into several more topics. For example, Stephanie shares her opinions and views on greenwashing within the industry. She also shares some really inspirational stories and also you know, AI, how that's shifting and changing things around. And once again, you can access this episode wherever you access your podcast. Just do that search for life as a dot dot. All right, well, I'll have another video, another profession covered coming right next week, so don't miss it. All right, we'll see you then.